Hey guys, hello and welcome to Spud Life with me, your host, Tatty Tim. Okay, so here's a little taster of what to expect in this week's episode. On this week's episode, I'm going to be discussing sensitive topics, including suicide and the loss of a loved one. This episode may not be suitable for everybody, so please listen with care. If you or someone you know is struggling, I've included links to relevant helplines in the episode description. Thank you for joining me. So let's begin this important conversation. I have got an amazing <laughs> guest. He really is amazing. As the story unfolds tonight, you will see what an amazing man he is. It's Mr. Andy Airy. Hey, Andy. Thank you so yeah. much for coming on the show. I'm, I am only slightly worried to be invited into the caravan of love. <laughs> so many conversations. I'm trying not to think about it. <laughs> He's got security outside just in case. <laughs> You're doing well. Yeah, yeah, really good. Well. Yeah, really well, good. Just completed an, another big walk, haven't you? Yeah, um, well, I've, I've spent a month outside, so if I wasn't yes, looking so. well, <laughs> there'd be something wrong with me. Yeah. So for people that don't know, and people that aren't watching on YouTube, Andy is part of a group called The Three Dads, The Three Dads Walking, and they started this, well, it's it's kind of very poignant because you, you've all said the same sort of thing in the book, that you're all part of a, a club that you never want to be in and you wouldn't want anybody to be in it, would you? And that's... One of the reasons for coming on the show mm. is to highlight and talk about openly and candidly about yep. the prevention of uh, suicide in, in well in anybody really yeah it is partic- particularly particularly young people. Uh, you lost your daughter Sophie to suicide in twenty eighteen. Yep. I mean, prior to that, just a normal, happy go lucky family. I know you kind of <laughs> separated when you were. Yeah, I mean, our family's was no different to anybody else's. Yeah. Um, you know, Soph was born um, just before Christmas, uh, 1989, it would be. And uh, shortly after that, um, my wife and I and Soph moved back up here. I'm originally from Threlkeld, you know, oh, just yeah. outside yeah, of Keswick. Yeah, yeah. But I'd been living in away, been in Manchester for year, quite a few years, but ended up moving back up here. Uh, so that was 1990. Um, George and I split up when Soph was about three or four, something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and George, Soph's mum, moved to Kendal with Soph. I, I was living in Skelton at the time. And uh, but I was seeing Sophie every week. You know, it was a very it's easy relationship. Split. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Soph, as a, as a girl, <clears throat> as a little girl, she was just, just bright, bubbly funny um just incredibly sociable she liked yeah. she liked one of these kids that liked adults and would, would talk to anybody yeah, yeah, yeah. so she wasn't particularly insular no nope, no not at all and then in her teens um she was mega sociable actually um she was turning into a bit of a party animal as she was growing up uh and was great company yeah um and then as a, as a young woman um just great to spend time with her i spent a lot of time outside because my um, uh, the reason I've moved back was actually um, I was just working at George Fisher. Right. Uh, in the end, I ended up yeah. as MD up there, and so my back my life at work was in the outdoors. Yeah. So I spent a lot of time outside of work, yeah, yeah. walking the fells, running, skiing, yeah. whatever. And so, so whether she liked it or not, kind of yeah. got dragged along. Well, I know you look at all of your pictures, especially on the on the, the website page. Mm. And it's all pictures of you and her. Outside yep. in all weathers, yep. outdoor clothes, you yep. know, just loving the, the outdoor lifestyle. Yeah, it? and that's what it was so. like. That's what it was like. And and Soph was just um, great company. She was just very funny. You yeah. just, um, you know, her default position would be to take the piss out of me. Yeah, yeah. Which is no bad thing. We also <laughs> had a laugh. Uh, and then it, as she she ended up going to uni and doing a, a nursing degree, right. which seemed to suit her. Absolutely down to ground. Yeah, it really did. She's uh, that sort of caring. Very empathetic. Yeah. Um, but also the kind of, uh, you know, the feedback we've had from her, her, her colleagues that she worked with was a good nurse in as much that she just, uh, she could be tough yes. when, yeah, when, yeah, when yeah, she needed yeah, to be. Because yeah. there is that skill that's needed to be yeah. a nurse, isn't there? Yeah. And so it, it, was a, it was a job that suited her. Um, after she qualified, she ended up, she worked in Lancaster originally and then... Um, just through a quirk of fate, got a job in Edinburgh. Yeah. So she'd moved up there with the guy that she'd been 
seen for a long time. They bought a flat and eventually got married uh, and seemed to be living a pretty good life, really. Yeah. Still contact with you? And oh, yeah. Sort of yeah. But, you know, well, all yeah, all, all, all the time. The, the way uh, we ended up with me and George, so Sof's mum, and Fiona, my wife, my wife um, you know, when Fee and I got together, Sof was seven. And so Sof was part of Fee's life yeah. for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and we all got on, yeah. you know, we, we just did, we, we got on uh, to the point where when after Soph left uni and there was no need, like no financial need or tie yeah, yeah, yeah. for us to, to be together, um, we used to see a lot of George um, because we were good friends. Just, yeah. And so come the summer of uh, 2018, you know, life, your life just trundles along. You kind of think the next day, the next yeah, week, the next yeah, me, yeah. month. Is going to be similar to what's yeah, gone before, yeah. and it just and it usually is. It usually is. Yeah. It usually you know, is. We've all got the oh well, save up for the holiday. Or yeah. we'll do this and I'll get this the next week. Yep. And, and it's just the, yeah. the part and parcel. Of yeah, you don't you don't think about the pot the potential of it, your, your life changing in an instant. No. It just doesn't. Yeah. Um, until it does. Yeah. And then um, the back end of the summer, um, Soph announced that she'd um, didn't love. Uh, husband anymore and yeah. moved out right. just, it, just, that was it, it was yeah. a bit, which was a real shock and we were worried about her yeah. um, because all you think about with your kids is you want them to be happy yeah. and and she was obviously unhappy yeah. um, but she was driving all this change in her life and so you're just like well what can we do to help um, and so I saw quite a lot of her during that autumn and she seemed okay yeah. she was emotionally volatile yeah, yeah. but going through what she was going through it was, it, there's it, nothing surprising no. and then in the run into Christmas she was due to come back um, or just before Christmas she sorted out a new flat for the new year she was actually moving jobs with, within the same hospital and it looked like things were really taking a quite a positive step forward yeah. and she was due to come down to us oh, well she was going down to her mum's first on the 20th of December but on the 19th we got a, well George your mum ended up getting a message to say that she was going to take her own life yeah oh my god I read that in the and that must have been the most oh powerful, my god like, yeah unbelievable phone call you really can't even uh, uh, I, 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 thinking back now it's it's you, you, I've got a, se a sense of what it was like but yeah. it's like the world changes instantly yeah um, as I know you say in the book that George rang you up when, mm. she, when she was between kind of sobs of mm. you kind of gathered mm. what what was going the message, on yeah. and then you're stuck down here yeah. you must have felt like so <laughs> helpless and <laughs> well, there must have been a gamut of emotions <sighs> that you just a bit, it, it was incomprehensible to yeah. start off wasn't it well you don't expect anything no. but no. how can you expect anything you like that yeah. I'd imagine if you've got a person in your life that is going through emotional problems and they are under maybe perhaps medication or mm. psychiatry then you wouldn't necessarily ex expect it as mm -hmm. a, but it might not be as much of a shock perhaps yeah if, the, if that person was already in a bad place yeah, yeah. they'd been in a bad place for a number of years because i know one of your one of the persons you, you met on their daughter had been let down by the system and yeah she ended up taking her life as well yeah so, and so. It, it's one of those things that I and mean, suicide is something that happens to other people's families. Yeah. Until it happens in yours. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And it's, you know, we've over the, since we've been thrown into this, this uh, world of suicide prevention, we've found out such a lot. Uh, for, for example, 70% uh, of the people who take their own lives aren't known to the mental health services. Yeah. So virtually all those do just, just don't, no, people don't see it coming. Yeah. So the vast majority of suicides just happen yeah. without warning. Yeah. And it, so it's like this explosion in, in a family and your life has changed in an instant. Yeah. And it's like, what the hell do you do? Yeah. Um, so, with, so with us, that's exactly what it was like. It was um, uh, with, with Soph, she, she actually said <laughs> in this message where she was going to leave the car and um, uh, apologise to, to all kinds of people. And then um, the police obviously turned up 
within minutes of this message going out yeah. and oh, so found the take, car. Did he take it as a? Oh yeah, they, because it, because it was because well, so sp- specific. Well, she signed off the message with "Please don't bury me," right. which is, <laughs> you know, it wasn't an, a, a, a call for help or anything like that. Yeah. So the police were there as soon as they could get there. They found the car, but Soph had gone. And it was three days before they found the body, so we we ended up going up to Ed, uh, Edinburgh, yeah. and it was awful. We, we were just oh. there was nothing we could do. No, sure. Um, we kind of got in the way of the people who were searching for her, and it was just yeah. awful. Because I know the, the guy that, that found her stayed with her yeah. until the police arrived. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he ended up coming to a funeral, didn't he? So. Yeah, we met him. Uh, as he turned, we turned up at Soul's funeral unexpectedly. Well, we obviously didn't expect it. Yeah. He got talking to a friend of mine who, yeah. once he found out who he was, he dragged him in. Yeah. And he introduced us Sandy, his lovely man. Yeah. And we've since become really good friends. Yeah. Really good friends. Yeah, so that was that was our Christmas 2018. And it was just awful because, um, you know, the Gregor, our lad, had just, we'd just started his first year at uni. And yeah. so... So he just finished the first term, yeah, yeah. Christmas back, yeah. and all that Christmas period was revolving around organising Solf's funeral. And uh, God, I felt for Gregor. My God, what he had to put up with. The the one thing we did decide that that day when um, the, the the found Solf's body, we talked about all kinds of stuff, yeah. which actually in hindsight, now that I've met loads of other suicide bereaved parents, we were. We seemed to get ahead of the curve somehow, and it was just a complete fluke. But one of the things we talked about that day was not cancelling Christmas. Yeah. Um, so we kind of left the decorations up, yeah, yeah. and we went through with Christmas. It was, it was hard. It was insane. Hard, hard, hard. Fee's mum came up, and we, we kind of battered our way through it. Uh, but we also talked about not allowing this terrible decision that Sophie had made not to crush our lives. We knew, we knew, and still know, that there's no way Soph would have wanted this decision that she's made yeah. to knacker our lives. Yeah, yeah. Despite the fact yeah. that yeah. it no. kind of has. Yeah. 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 But we, she just wouldn't. Such no. a caring, loving person. Yeah. She wouldn't want to impose that upon us, yeah. despite she the fact it does. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, but we also, in amongst that, that afternoon when we were in a snotty mess, talked about um, trying to trying to generate something positive out of the mess. So almost that afternoon we talked about that. Right. So we didn't know what it could be. Obviously, didn't know what it could be. And you were all in the same boat. All three of you was kind of in that same mindset that we thought. Yeah, eventually with with us it was that the that afternoon um, we were back. We'd come back from Edinburgh. Yeah. Um, before they found Soul's body because it was just torture being up there. Yeah. And so we were all uh, back in the Eden Valley when it, that happened. Um, but yeah, the three of us sat. So it's me, Fiona, my wife, and and Gregor. Oh, no, no. Yeah. George, George was very much in the same boat, but she was with her uh, partner, yeah. Shorty, and her brother. But separately, they actually had very similar conversations to us. Right. The idea that if we couldn't let Soph's death and suicide just, just couldn't sure. let it go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, if it wasn't going to crush us, yeah, and if it wasn't going to crush us, we had to do something. To f- something positive, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly that. But we didn't know what it was. No. So that was kind of through there, and and what actually happened was, we knew when we all got together. So, um, so it was the three of us: me, Fee, and Gregor, and George. Uh, we all sat down to try and talk about the funeral and what could it look like. Yeah. And it was had to be a celebration of, of Sophie's life. It had to be as, as kind of upbeat as yeah, possible, yeah. best possible. And we also knew that we had to support a, so a suicide prevention charity at the funeral, and but we didn't know which one. And it was one of those things, you, if you Google suicide prevention charities, you get the top two are Samaritans and Mind. Yeah. And then everything below it, we didn't recognise. You know, I'm a, a trustee of the Lake District Foundation, which is a small environmental charity up here. Yeah. And it, that gave me a particular view of charities, which is the big ones can always look yeah. after themselves. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, so we put Samaritans of Mind to one side. So you just went down to Google search. Who are, who are these people? Yeah. 
and trying to pick one out was impossible. So I contacted a friend of mine who's had been involved in um, uh, health charities, uh, and Sarah just came back to me and said papyrus. I like that. Yeah. It turned out actually, I didn't find out for about a year and a half that the reason she said it wasn't because of her work in charities. It was because. Um, Papyrus, she'd come across papyrus when a young man at her a school at her, her sons were at took his own life right. and papyrus came in afterwards talk. yeah wow. to pick up the pieces so that's how she yeah. found them yeah. uh, but she just pointed us at them and when we looked at that website you know the first thing at the website then on the papyrus website the first page said suicide's the biggest killer under 35s yeah. in the country yeah. and we kind of thought that can't be right and of course it is, yeah. and, it, it, and that's, that's true. But it made us look at the website and I ended up phoning them up and it turned out there's blooming brilliant people. And so that's who we supported at the, at the funeral. And uh, that that's that, that relationship. A family's in exactly the same position as you. And they, and they sort of knew exactly, it wasn't like somebody who'd been on a course. Nope. You know, they knew exactly what you were going through, didn't they? Yeah, the charity was started by, um, it was uh, Jean Reed um, in the, um, well, it'd be 26 years, so the early 90s. Right. Um, and she lost the, or their family lost the son. Yeah. And she wanted to support a, a, a charity that helped prevent young suicides and looked around and found there wasn't there one. Wasn't one. And so she got together with a few other suicide brave parents and started it in in Lancashire, uh, and that's that's where it came from. And is it global now, or is it? Just no, it's it's UK. Is it? it it's is the, it? so it's a UK wide footprint. Yeah. Um, and it also was aimed at being a national charity, despite the fact it just started from a kitchen table in yeah, North in yeah. North Lancashire. Yeah. 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 Uh, but it's amazing to think that it took up to the nineties. Because mm. my wife's um, mother, mother-in-law. She used to work at Birmingham University. Okay. And there was a classic sort of high rise building mm. in the middle of the campus mm -hmm. um, every year. Yep. Two to three. Yep. And this was going back to the 70s, yep. the 80s. Yep. And this was, you know, and, yeah. and to think that there was nothing about. No, I know, it's shocking, isn't it? And, you know, 20, 20, 20, however many years. Yeah, I know, I know. For, for something like this to. Well, the thing is, with, with suicide, it, the, the stigma around it meant that people just didn't talk about it. About it yeah. and, and people who'd lost loved ones, it was one of those things, from the outside, it was like just a, it's a very sad story. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you, you express condolence if you can. Yeah. And then you kind of let them get on with it. Yeah. And generally, those families just kind of internalised it. Yeah. Um, and just didn't talk. talk. Yeah. But it's only in, in recent years that it's become a thing that where you, uh, I suppose with the opening up of mental health conversation, that it's something that, you, that more people have spoken yeah, about. Yeah. But for, for us, it was once you, that discovery that it's the biggest killer of young people, ma male and female, it just forces you to go, Christ almighty, you've got to do something about it. Yeah, yeah. And got to talk about it. Absolutely. Um, so that's that's kind of how we started as a family in the, that spring of 2019. Yeah. So how was Sophie's funeral? Was it good? She would have, she would have loved it. <laughs> so it was like her favourite songs. Yeah, you know, real yeah. Fresco, no, it was there was uh, we held it at um, it was the, the crematorium at uh, no no the, we, because it was at Kendall we were down at Milnthorpe. Oh yeah, and there's a fantastic. Um, uh, it's like a farm diversification where it's like an old barn that it's beautiful inside. Yeah. It's like the same thing, same, it's the same people who've done the one. The one at Temple Fairway. Yep. Yeah. So it's like that. Yeah. Uh, but it's obviously a bit older. Yeah. Uh, so it's a really, it's a lovely place, really nice place. And we had hundreds of people, hundreds, yeah. hundreds. Yeah. And then we were up at Carras Green, the golf course at uh, just to the north of Kendall, um, looking out. Big glass windows looking out up towards Kentmere and the and the South Lake yeah. District Fells, and it was just lovely. Um, loads of people from all aspects of Sos life, yeah. and it was it really was very. It was just fantastic. Say so she would have loved it. Yeah, just a real good celebration. Yeah, of a sadly short life. Mm. But, so. And but there we are. And we walked away from that, 
um, I'd raised several thousand pounds for the charities. Oh, yep. And then it was, what do we do now, you know? And um, we didn't didn't really know, but I was I was kind of my hand was forced because Soph had been training to run a, a half marathon in Northumbria. Yeah, and yeah. and she'd been trying to get me to run it, and I'd, I'd just ignored her because like bloody half marathon. No yeah, <laughs> and I'd done a lot previously, but I just thought I can't be asked to yeah. do that. Um, but then after we lost Soph, Laura, her mate, who she was training with, yeah. she said she was going to run on and raise funds for papyrus. Right. And so that very quickly turned my head into, instead of just going across to support, it was like, shit, I'm going to have to run it. Yeah. And then when I en- tried to enter, I found the entries were closed. So I then phoned um, the people who were, who were organising it, Endurance Life, who were organising it. And once I explained who I was and why I was phoning them, they allowed me to run on Soph's entry. Yeah. And I, I remember putting the phone down and thinking, that's a great story. I'm sure I can do something. Do this. Yeah. And so I started, uh, uh, I ended up doing daily videos of my training under this hashtag run for Soul Free. Yeah. And I uh, got a lot of traction. A lot of the local press covered it. Yeah. Uh, radio picked it up. Uh, Look North picked it up. And so uh, I ended up raising... It was something over forty thousand pounds, but the thing was, the penny dropped after about a week. That the fundraising was the byproduct. The money was the byproduct, and what was really happening were I was getting people talking about, talking about yeah. and introducing folk to papyrus, yeah, yeah. and it was that realization in in that process. Of, by the time I got to the end of the run, I was beyond committed to working with papyrus. <laughs> yeah, it just yeah. Happened. It was funny, you know, one of the things that day we lost Soph, you know, one of the things I said, we can't let Sophie's death uh, govern the rest of our lives. No. What I was thinking there was we couldn't let that awful decision that she'd made just crush us into a yeah, place yeah. that was didn't allow us to live. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I didn't realise that the decisions I would end up making absolutely forced me down this suicide prevention route, but all done for very, very positive reason. Absolutely. Uh, anyway, I still find myself sitting in your <laughs> in bloody caravan of love. <laughs> no, no, no. Mm. Oh God, yeah, no. But here we are. So, so that was us at the start of spring 2019, and I just kept doing loads of stuff. More and more and more. Yeah. But then you, I know you met. Was it you met Mike first? Didn't you? Was you introduced to Mike? First yeah. Before? Well, they they, the, they kind of knew each other before, didn't they? It was yeah. We we so that was us starting nine uh, twenty nineteen. Yeah. Uh, and I just was doing more and more stuff with Papyrus as 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 that year went on and yeah. into the start of twenty twenty. With with Mike and Tim, Mike's uh, sale in Manchester and Tim's just outside of Kings Lynn in Norfolk. Norfolk yeah. Had no interaction. Didn't know each other. Yeah. And at the start of lockdown, they both lost their daughters, uh, Emily and Beth. Um, It was Tim uh, lost Emily first. And it was the week um, when the pandemic was coming, the week where we hadn't quite gone into the proper lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, with Emily, she was 19. um, Tim and Sue got four children. And uh, Emily was the the second of the four of the four right. and they knew she was different yeah. to the other three yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was only when she was 15 they got a, di- a very late diagnosis of high functioning autism right and it it that changed emily's life and their family's life because from this girl who outwardly looked um fine yeah. and kept exploding at home yeah once they realized what was going on yeah, yeah. It enabled her to to get to grips, get some support. Yeah. She got GCSEs. She went and did a an art course. Um, she worked in the pub, passed a driving test, loved driving round, yeah. and uh, so she seemed to have a life very much sorted yeah. and and under control. But then the, that week uh, before lockdown was properly announced, they started coughing as a family, right. and so Tim had uh, called Emily for the gym. She was at. And said, "You've got to come home. We've got to." And she said, "He said she had a bit of a blow up. Yeah. 
but then calmed down, uh, did a load of shopping on the way home. Yeah. And uh, for the first couple of days, seemed to be very relaxed. And then the third morning, woke up in a real distressed state and said, I've got to go for a walk. Got to take the dogs for a walk. And, um, or the dog for a walk. And Tim just said, we can't. The, the rules say, if we're coughing, we've got to stay in. Yeah. So she exploded in the house, which they'd seen before, so yeah. didn't, nothing nothing unusual, yeah. And then 15 minutes later, they found her when she'd uh, tried to take her own life. She'd survived, yeah. um, uh, but ended up in intensive care right. in a COVID ward because they didn't know what to do. Yeah. Um, and... Um, I, but realised very quickly that she wasn't going to recover. Uh, and so five days later, they t they turned off the life support. Uh, they, 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 so they also found out after a couple of days that it wasn't COVID, it was the common cold. Uh, and then Tim's uh, calling of the rules effectively killed, a, yeah. killed his daughter. This yeah. is terrible. Yeah. Uh, the one thing that he has as a family, there's a family, their little um, kind of glimmer of hope was the fact that uh, Emily had signed up for as a, an organ donor. Right, yeah. uh, and so um, her organs were taken and, yeah. and helped a lot of people. So that, that gives them a lot yeah. of uh, succor, really. And did they then, did they have a similar sort of mindset as you? No, a... no. It took a bit, a bit of a, a, a slow build. I think what actually happened was a, a, a few weeks later, <clears throat> they were having to clear out Emily's room because yeah. uh, uh, Sue's mum had, had broken a, a leg and had to come and stay somewhere, and so they were clearing out Em's room and found a note that she'd written, um, which amongst various other things was "Don't be ashamed of me," yeah. and if if somebody else can learn from what I've done please help them use that and so that gave tim yeah. the spark yeah, yeah to do it yeah. so it was kind of him and did he find piracy in a similar way to you no he, he was no he, he found it in the end through mike because what would happen with mike uh, and his family in in manchester five days after emily had died um their daughter beth took her own life she was 17 wow. And she lived for music and performance. Yeah, she yeah. was she was training yeah, to be a vocal artist. Pictures and, and she's all she had a CD out, didn't she? Yep. And all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And so she she lived a life outside the family home, yeah. doing gigs yeah. and, and, and a, a, a consummate, consummate performer. Yeah. And then when lockdown came, effectively all her life was shut down. Shut down. Yeah. Uh, her eighteenth birthday party, which they'd been planning, was gone, yeah, yeah. and everything that she was working on just had gone. Stopped. And um, it, they didn't see anything coming. No. Um, you know, in, Mike says in hindsight, having learnt some of the things we've learnt, Maybe. could he have asked a question? Yeah. Um, but it, it just didn't. But it, it wasn't registered. Didn't it? it you didn't. Know, we know our children better than anybody. Yep. Ever. And if you thought for one millisecond that there was, then hundred percent. Yeah. You react. Yeah. But the fact that they don't give you any inkling whatsoever no nope. we're not mind readers are we so no and you and, and you, i mean you must have beat yourself up <laughs> it must it, have been yeah um, it, it's easy to get stuck in that what ifs you yeah. know uh, why didn't we or what could we say yeah. but there lies massive danger doesn't it you just but then it, that's where you've got this immense strength that you've just like a phoenix rising from the ashes <laughs> you? you just yeah. like yeah. You've just kind of gone. Woof, yeah. Something. But where did you, you find that inner strength? Do you think? Uh, it's have, that, you all, have you always been that sort of person? Well, m my reaction has always been when in, when things have been challenging, whether you, when you end up in situations that you don't want to be in. Yeah. My my reaction has always been, I didn't want to be here yet, but what do we do next? Yeah. What do we do next? Um, and certainly that that has always been my mindset. Yeah. And and this was definitely. Obviously, very extreme, extreme but, yeah. but but it was that's the way I thought. So with with, with Mike and his family, they were in pieces. Uh, obviously, had a like Tim had a a COVID funeral yeah. with a half a dozen people, yeah. uh, and uh, Mike was suicidal. But you know, he he 
he actually wrote down his thoughts in that of that time some of which we, we uh, he's got in the book I did. um but the, when you read the whole thing he did write it's just a scary place he's just writing yeah, what he felt yeah yeah but did that help him though well it was encouraged to do it um a couple of his friends and his, his sister encouraged him to do it yeah and it certainly i think distracted him yeah but what happened about it was about three weeks after after uh, beth had died uh he and tim got together and it was just complete well it was to do with surviving children so tim tim's eldest da daughter annie annabelle had seen this story of this family in manchester that seemed to be going through something very similar to them yeah and somehow she'd reached out and ended up contacting tim's uh, mike's middle daughter right, yeah. another emily and that conversation led to her talking to Mike, right. which then led to Mike talking to Tim. Yeah, yeah. And without doubt, once they started talking to each other, that was a massive, um, it's, it's a huge support when you're talking to other suicide yeah, bereaved parents. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we've, that's one, another thing we've learned, that suicide bereaved parents can give each other huge amounts of support. Yeah. And it's because you cut out any crap. Yes. Because yeah you know what they felt like yeah. and they know yeah. what we've been yeah. through yeah. and you yeah. so you don't so there's, there's no whitewashing nothing or tiptoeing around the edges no nope. it's just like you're straight to the yeah juggler oh, yep. yeah until you can talk about anything. anything yeah and that's what happened with those two and um, because they were so open with each other right from the start and that realization that you're not alone yes yeah it kept mike going it I definitely kept it, kept it him going give you that sort of hope because it, even though with your strength and the fact that you've almost straight away decided that you were going to do something positive there must have been that feeling that you were the only person in the world and that yeah sort of emptiness of well, you know yeah what can you do what can i do uh, for me what helped was papyrus and finding papyrus uh, and obviously through them realized there were all these other suicide bereaved families uh, and and that real also the realization that you could help mm. other people not go down that route that that has really got me uh, gave, gave me a real purpose yes. and a real focus. With those two, they kept each other going and really helped each other through the early months. And they were starting to get their heads around what to do next. Obviously, Tim had found that note from Emily that yeah. said, if this help other people. And so those two were starting to talk about what what could they do. So this was summer, autumn of 2020. Yeah. Uh, obviously, with it being lo uh, COVID yeah. and lockdown, the, there wasn't a lot. A lot you could do. Yeah. And so they just started to scratch around what they could possibly do. Mike had actually found Papyrus through a friend, actually, who'd introduced him to a, a, a charity event. Yeah. And the charity that was being supported was this charity. So Mike spotted it and realised we wanted to know more, found out more, and he ended up partly to do with his grief he was trying to work out what what has he missed yeah and so he started doing loads of um uh, uh suicide awareness and suicide prevention courses right. many of them run by papyrus yeah and it was just to get a feel of what what, what, what had got wrong yeah yeah and that, that's why he started but then of course he realized that this charity was doing fantastic work yeah and that's how tim found out because mike told him about them right yeah, yeah. um and it was in one of these courses that he actually um, sat down next to Gregor, our son. Right. So the... Uh, the moment, did you say that Gregor went down, was it after he'd finished his uni? Or no, he was, was he, still he was still at uni. So so Gregor was at uni in, in Liverpool. Yeah. And the Papyrus had offices in Warrington, so it's not far away. Yeah. And he'd signed up to do a course, very much to find out more about the charity. Yeah. To see if there's something that he that would be useful for him to help other people. Yeah. So he'd gone on this course and happened to sit down next to Mike, right. just a fluke. Yeah. And they got talking to each other. And because I'd, would, I'd been quite high profile in, in the charity yeah. by then, Mike eventually went, so who's this room for Sophie bloke? Is he? Is he still? Is and he Greg still? went, who's my dad, you know? <laughs> and uh, so Mike kind of went, ah, do you think he's up for another challenge? And, uh, and Greg went, I don't know. But here's his number. <laughs> Give him a ring. And... And if Gregor did tell me that night that I was intrigued to see what he'd made of the course, yeah. 
but he said this thing had happened this mank um, <laughs> big uh, well, a fellow called mike had uh, give it give me given this monk my phone number yeah. and um in all honesty i forgot about it because the next it's it was december the 11th right um it's funny when we look back it was like it's, that was the day before what would have been sophie's 31st birthday right. and so consequently the conversation i had with gregor about this fella called mike yeah. went out my head because yeah. you find anniversaries when they come round uh, shitty at the best of times yeah. so it's it, the next day would, would what would have been sophie's 31st birthday and then the following week the 19th was the second anniversary of a death yeah. Yeah. and then it's uh, oh and, and then it's christmas, christmas yeah. and so it's like it's yeah. gone yeah and so it was it wasn't until the new year when this bloke phoned me up and said i'm mike <laughs> um and it reminded me of about yeah. gregor yeah, yeah. and I was like, oh, right and so that's how I got together with Mike. Yeah. He told me about this chap, Tim, who'd helped him. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Mike and I have arranged to, to meet, actually, for, rather than to keep talking on the phone. Just, hey, let's go for a walk. Because you took him on a mega walk, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> that was some walk you're talking about. <laughs> that bridge, when you get to that far, it's yeah, it was lovely. Unbelievable, isn't it? Funnily enough, we were there yesterday were you? and got wet through. <laughs> 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 it was just like, I just wanted to get out of the house. But yeah, we just walked over Smardale Fell and yeah. around Smardale. It, 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 it's it is a beautiful spot, it is, isn't it? it? Yeah. But that walk we did was um, I remember coming back, got home from it, and I was knackered. Not obviously, it's not far. It's no. Yeah, six or seven miles yeah. or whatever. Yeah. But we were because of what we were talking we were about. Emotionally knackered. As well. oh, yeah. It really was just absolutely battered. Yeah. Um, but it was that 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 sharing of of emotions, yes, yeah, and and talking through what each other's families have gone through yeah. and were going through, yeah. and um, that idea of what can you do. And interestingly enough, it's one of the, again something else we've learned as suicide bereaved parents, particularly in the early stages of their grief, when they come across other suicide bereaved parents that were farther down the line, it's it's that kind of working out how to get from yeah, where you are yeah, yeah exactly yeah. and it's that feeling is incredibly important if you can get a hold of somebody right. and, and there, there's, there aren't any straight answers no. but just having the knowledge that somebody's got from where you are to, to that point yeah. yeah and i mean where everybody's different yeah there's nothing to say that they're going to get to that point ever but they might go to a point just to decide it yeah might not, yeah or, you know so like you say it's, it's a nice beacon of hope well that's it, isn't it? hope that's that's a, the, the word hope runs through everything in yeah. the end yeah and so yeah so that's where we were uh, so it was we we went that walk i think it was april may time start of 2021 and in it um mike had said told me about tim but then he also said uh, i've had an idea and and uh, mike's idea was based on the, the realisation that suicide doesn't discriminate. No. It can happen to any family, yeah. anywhere. Exactly. And he said, well, if we walk between our houses, yeah. that would show it can happen to any family, yeah. in any part of the country, yeah. and we could maybe raise a bit of money for papyrus. Yeah. And he's like, oh, that's a brilliant idea. Because it's, it's right. such a simple <laughs> idea. Yeah. And like, yeah, well, I'm, I'm up for it. Yeah. And I said, remind me where, where uh, Tim lives. <laughs> Uh, Norfolk. <laughs> you do know where Norfolk is, Mike. Yeah, he didn't. <laughs> yeah, so that that, but that was it. As soon as he said it, it was, it was like I, it was such a simple idea. Let's do it. And so I don't know. The following week, we had a Zoom call. So it was the first time I met Tim. Yeah. Uh, and again, we talked about our girls and what we'd gone through yeah. and what our family's going through and. And we kind of kept exploring that idea of what can we do? Yeah. What, what, what positive thing can we pick out of this mess yes. to leave some kind of positive legacy in, in memory of our daughters? I think with on Tim's side as well, when he when he tells his story, you know, one of the things that was a real powerful um, incentive for him was on the day of of Emily's funeral when they had the half a dozen people in the 
in the crematorium yeah. and then they got back to their their house and he sat with his, his, his wife sue in pieces and one of the things that sue said to him in that crying mess was that's it she's gone this will be forgotten in a year's time yeah. and that kind of struck a chord with yeah, that course, no shit. Mm, so what can we do yeah and so, so there's a lot of different things kind of built that idea in all three of us yeah. of what do we do yeah. and what, what, pos- what things positive we can do and then through the, these quirks of fate through our surviving children that's how we got together um, and which is a testament to the internet as well isn't it oh, yeah. you know because yeah. what in 30 years ago would this have happened no it's unlikely no. isn't it no you know, and it's the fact that social media they've seen your hashtags yeah, yeah. girls have gone yep. oh yep. join together and then yeah, yeah, it is. It's you know, it's one of the things. Again, a conversation we have many times. People say uh, how social media played an impact in the suicides of our our daughters. As far as we're aware, in you know, our three cases, the answer's no. But obviously, um, there are some very clear examples, like Mo- Molly Russell last year yeah. uh, on an inquest. You know, it was quite clear that she was down those horrible rabbit holes. Yeah. So we know double, it's like a double-edged. Sword oh, massive! Thing, yeah, yeah. But we've used social media as been a real positive tool in our armory yeah. to get our message out. Yeah. And, and, you know, when, when this thing goes out, I'll be firing out with all the three dad <laughs> stuff, you know. It's, it's going out to all the people who follow us. Um, because it's great, you know, we can reach anywhere. Well, it is. And, it, it's, and it's, it's good in the fact that we're now at a stage where people are happy to talk mm. about things, you know. And just normalising these sort of conversations mm-hmm. without fear of because people have said oh what are you going to say what are you going to do it's like well I'll just, just, we'll just talk <laughs> <laughs> we're, just, we're just two blokes in a caravan <laughs> talking yeah. you know and that's and if you make these conversations as normal as possible like I have people that are that have sat exactly where you are but the guy the other week he was a reformed heroin addict mm. he talks about how he tried to kill himself how he did sections his mental health issues how he was abused and he just wants things like this to be normalized yep so it's just people watching listening they can feel this if they can just approach me you yep the, the mate the yep. mom the dad whoever and just say you know what i'm feeling a bit shit today yeah or, you know what it's really it's important things. it is it's it's it's, it's, it's it, you wouldn't think that just asking for help or just to say i'm feeling a bit crappy today would be such a difficult thing to do you know especially in this day and age you know when we were growing up maybe it was that kind of it was a completely different era for a start yep. wasn't it yeah yep. and there was probably still a lot of that, that british little police yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. attitude wasn't there you know and and it was it just wasn't even talked about full stop and now the fact that it is becoming through social media mm. which is helping it's becoming a more normalized subject it can only be it's what we need to do this this is how this is how we actually help each other um you know one of the things that we've learned along our way at the heart of all this is it's effectively help seeking behavior so it's what we want to instill in in young people that when things are are not right in their lives that ability to go this isn't right yeah can you help me yeah and and certainly our age you're not brought up to ask for help you're brought up to sort things out yeah, 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 toughen up, yeah. sort yeah. it out, yeah. uh, pull yourself together, all that kind, all that kind of stuff. Whereas, what we know, um, you know, when it comes to suicide, seventy percent of the people who take their own lives aren't known to the mental health services, and so that all those people in there that that I weren't expressing stuff overtly have tried to solve all their problems internally. Yeah, yeah and it hasn't worked. And all you need, uh, like the day the day Sophie took her own life. I actually spoke to her on the phone that afternoon. She phoned me. Um, uh, my wife and I were actually having um, yellow fever inoculations at Boots in Carlisle because we were going to see uh, Fee's brother who lives in Africa. So phoned me. And she she actually laughed at me because I'd, it turned out yeah, I'd pocket dialed her. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And just so she took the piss out of me for, yeah. for pocket dialing her. Yeah. Um, and it was just a nothing of conversation. And she as she signed off. The last words she ever said to me were happy jabs. Yeah. We subsequently found out she was on her way to take her own life. That that she was on her way then. Wow. 
to where she left the car. And all she needs to do was say, help me, Dad. Help me, yeah, Dad. And so you imagine, you know, knowing that, we've got to get our young people to be able to say, help me. Yeah. Uh, well, anybody to say, help me. Yeah. And, and the, one of the things that we've done accidentally is, because we've been so open about how we feel and, and our experiences, we've created this kind of weird safe space that when, certainly when we're out walking, people come and walk with us and share stuff. Yeah. Just open up in front of you. And uh, not just people that have lost people through suicide. But all kinds all know. kinds of conversations. Yeah. We're all kinds of conversations. Um, and it's it's actually a real privilege yeah. to to feel that people trust you to be able yes, to do it. Yeah. yeah, and I know you're saying about since you've been doing this um, for the Spud Life yeah. podcast, yeah. Where people have come, come to you, to re- come to the store, yeah. And just said it's fantastic, and, and they found a place where they can, like that, probably that safe space from his own. Where normally we would have just talked shite about the weather yep. and what you've done at the weekend. Yep. But now they know, and they can just say, "Yep, we're going to do." And then I'll more than happily spins as long as it takes. Yeah, to, exactly. You know, either, not necessarily talk them down. Cause no, no. At that point, but they're at that that first step. Exactly. And that's all you need is yep. someone. You know what? Because as well, over the years, the amount of people that I've known that have committed suicide that have been customers, and it's always the one you'd least expect. I know. Always. I know. 100% guarantee. Yeah. It's like, oh, you're gobsmacked. I know. It's just like, I know. What? That's it. It's, so, so, it's like, you can't believe it. No, I know. And they're exactly probably how, like how Sophie was with you. Yep. Last week, you know, that literally the one guy, it was the next day. I know. He'd been cracking away. I know. I know. The thing is, you don't know what's going on in people's yeah, heads no, until, until they open until, up. Yeah. One thing what you want to do, Tim, don't never use the word committed. It, yes. that, that, that phrase yes. is definitely cross it out. Yeah. And it's because that harks back to when suicide was illegal. Yes. Yeah. You know, so it's like. Actually, com- I, I slipped up one because. <laughs> <the first. laughs> it's, a good, it's a good one, though, because it is a learning thing. Let's fire it down there <laughs> for everybody. Don't. Never. Yeah. Ne- you never. On one of my previous episodes, uh, Josh. Hello, Josh. Do you have a, I know you're watching. We, we talked about suicide being uh, in in men, yeah, being the biggest killer of men under fifty. I think, yeah, it's it's it's, like it's, it's massive. And I kind of said, yeah, death by suicide. I didn't say, uh, and he said, oh yeah, that's great. They phrased it as yeah. death by suicide rather yeah. than committed suicide. And we had a similar conversation. It's really good. And then, but I to learn, it's, uh, it's, it's like ingrained. Years, you have it's ingrained because you know, it was when we were growing up. I know that was, that was the phrase. A, wasn't it, it is absolutely, and, and until you, until we actually get thrown into this world. Why wouldn't you know? Exactly. So yeah. it's a it's a good yeah. thing to to give the opportunity to say it. Yeah, because when it comes down to it, it's saying committed suicide is like saying somebody committed a heart attack yes. or committed a tumor. You yeah. know, yeah. it's like yeah. it it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't. So but no, but so thank you for giving us the opportunity <laughs> to do that. You're welcome. So the walk begins. I know mm. you've got a lot because it was still. It must have just been. So it was 2022. So. No, oh, twenty one. The first oh, walk. The walk. Yeah, the first one. yeah, yeah. Was it? So we did it. It once we got together and started talking about it. It, it was. It, we knew we had a lot of stuff to organise yeah. the logistics. We knew we had a lot. And it was twenty two with all the accolades, the accolades and everything. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and it was. It was. Um, we thought initially. We thought about doing it in the spring 2022 yeah but we got, we got quite excited about it because it looked like a, a really interesting thing to do yeah. and so we thought sorry let's do it in we had this little gap bit of a window in in the autumn of 21 let's do it then so that was it we, we aimed everything at starting um it was right at the start of october 2021 and away we went you know we, we first met we had loads of zoom things but then we first met I think it was June 21 yeah. in Mike's house because it was obviously easier for me to go down and, yeah. and, and Tim come across. So we had a weekend in sale and we drank quite a lot of beer and we looked at a lot of maps and by the time we'd finished we'd got this kind of a line on the map yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'd pushed them. Uh, so my background was sales and marketing. Yeah. So I was saying, we've got to have a website, so we need some photos. Uh, and it's where that, the very first photo of the three of us in the T-shirts, me and the, the white, me and the white one. Yeah, uh, which is a bad choice. Anyway, uh, 
so that's where that those photos came from and that was kind of it and and um i think it was tim that said about the name three dads walking yeah, yeah. Like, yeah does what it says on the tin yeah, let's yeah. do it yeah and so that then started the chain of events through mutual friends i ended up talking to a, a, a web design company in Stavely, yeah. who then produced our website that became quite a, an important well still is a very important thing there were other friends i know uh, i'd organized the tracker that we were going to carry and, yeah. and have carried on all three walks yeah um yeah 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 that the team, the yeah god that, that was very funny <laughs> yeah yeah how do you hide this from the world let's wrap it with tinfoil oh come on then and uh yeah so that things just kind of fell into place and then um because of the sport i'd had from alison freeman the bbc yeah. look north yeah. when i'd done the run for sophie stuff i'd said to the other two i've got this tame journalist yeah. <laughs> not sure how Alison takes that um but they said if well if you trust her yeah yeah we're happy that yeah. you and uh, so I phoned Alison and um you know she her reaction immediately was I'm sure I can get this on BBC brec uh, on breakfast right and so she went and talked to her producers yeah. and they then commissioned her and Adam Nolan, who uh, works with her a lot, the cameraman, to come out and film us. Uh, so they ended up producing a really sh a short film, which was fantastic. So they'd come here one morning, film, yeah. film me on the top of Shap, actually. <laughs> it wasn't raining. Uh, and then went down to Manchester and filmed Mike, and then the next day and, and yeah, to Norfolk. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. so they then had that programme that, that went out on breakfast about 10 days before we did the walk. Right. And it was just amazing. It just really hit a nerve. Yeah, it did. Wow, it, it just, just went yeah, mental. yeah, and it raised. I mean, our profile suddenly shot up. Yeah, uh, the f funds started piling into the the Just Giving account. And then Daniel Craig. Just yeah. <laughs> well, that was the that was the day before the walk the started. Walk, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it was when Mike and Tim were on the way up to Moreland. Yeah. Um, Papyrus said we've got this ten thousand pound donation. From Daniel Craig, and we're just trying to get permission from his people yeah. for to use it, yeah. which they did. Yeah, uh, and there's loads of celebrities that give money to yeah that we'll never know about. Yeah, aren't they? So, mm. but at the same point, you want that. It, yeah, we never thought you want about that it. Thing as well, don't you? Yeah, well, no. it, it, we you never thought we never thought about the the power of, of personality. No, but obviously at the time. He was the biggest star in the film side of the world because the last James Wong film it got cancelled just before. Came well, straight down, wasn't it? Wasn't yeah, it? and so it had only just been released the yeah. month before. Yeah, so he was massive. Was like Brian Scott Hill, wasn't he? And so you know, by the time I think at the, the end of the end of the first day, there was was it pushing two hundred thousand pounds in the just giving a just last it, yeah. Wow. It was it was bonkers, completely and utterly bonkers. So before. Before you guys had started this, was Papyrus just kind of trickling along? No, it was the the, the grown steadily yeah. from from it being formed, and we're accelerating the growth um, in the previous five or six years. Yeah, they were definitely going from a small charity to a, a medium, a medium size. size one, yeah. and they had lots of plans, um, particularly opening more offices across the country, yeah. and they also had plans to get the the Run Hope line. Um, well, it's Hope Line twenty four seven. It is now, but this this Hope Line is a, a crisis line for young people either to phone up themselves and ask for help, or people who are worried yeah. they can open, phone up and ask for advice. Yeah. What can I do? I'm worried about this young person. Yeah. What advice can you give me? And the and the line is actually staffed by uh, suicide prevention professionals, so it's the paid paid people. Right, yeah. They're not volunteered, yeah. and they will twenty four seven. Well, initially it wasn't when when we were going. It was running when we first started. It was nine in the morning till midnight, but they had plans for it to go twenty four seven. With the cash that we generated, it allowed Papyrus to open more offices quicker, and recruit to go into a twenty four seven service. So Hope Line is now twenty four seven. It's fun. It's fantastic. It was one of the greatest things when they told us that they could do that. Brilliant. You thought, wow. And and the cash we'd raised. They, they were going to get there yeah, without us. Yeah. They would, they would, they would have eventually got there. Yeah. yeah. 
so uh, no, it's been that has been very. Um, uh, it's been a great. Um, uh, it's been humbling. It's been amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Humbling is a good word because it's you know the the action of sharing this our stories yeah. and how people then react yeah. to us. You end up being on the receiving end of, as we mentioned before, a lot of other people's stories yeah. and and they them telling you their experiences. Actually, some of the most powerful ones are where uh, uh, people who survived suicide attempts yeah. will come and talk to us, yeah. and that is massively powerful because they they reassure you that yes, people can have a second or third or fourth chance, you know, and live lives that are fulfilling and happy. Maybe not every day of the week, but you can see that that just by having suicidal thought, it doesn't mean your your life is knackered. No. You can uh, get out the other side. Yeah. So those have been powerful, but then also in terms of the support we've got on the walks themselves as well, they were kind of built on kindness because we didn't stay, we've never stayed in hotels. No. We stay in people's houses and people would step forward and say, come and stay with me. I'll put you up, I'll feed you, yeah. I'll wash your underpants. <laughs> and here's it, it the biggest pack lunch you'll ever see to go out for another walk, you know? Yeah, yeah. And and so everything we've done it is just restores your faith. Oh, you know, absolutely, it? it's it's fantastic. It? It's just really it's to be on the receiving end of all that, all love, that love. Yeah, it is yeah. phenomenal, yeah. and it does feel yeah. It's a very special place, and it is yeah. Humbling's the right word because it's like look at the, what people are doing, you know, yeah. and people can do. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's been a very weird world we've lived in from Mike's that original idea of let's go for a, a walk, yeah. you know. Because I know all the way down the whole of the walk, I haven't got through all of the book yet, but it just seems you were just supported literally every step of the way, weren't you? Yep. You know, amazing. Because obviously, like you say in the book, people could track you. I said it wasn't yep. that difficult for a thing to intercept you. No. Nope. Cut you off at the pass, literally. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. On the walk oh, it's amazing. Amazing. And, and like you say, you must have heard so many sort of uplifting stories as well as yeah, as well as sort of. Sad story. Oh, without doubt. Yeah, there was a lot of so much positivity in there. Yeah. We, we met so many people who were doing great work as well. Obviously, we we focus on papyrus, but we met so many other people doing uh, work for other charities. Some big, some small, um, some little tiny ones that are just set up in the memory of a single person. You know, yeah. no, there's been amazing finding so out the work. Was there any? Is there any help for the the, the, the remaining family? You know, people like yourselves. Is there any sort of mental health yeah. help out there for you guys? Yeah, there is. Does but the you virus cover that or not? Not really, it's, but they, they do. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're very much focused on uh, prevention of young suicide. That's, 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 their, their that's what yeah. they do. Yeah. But it's one of those things that once you're actually involved with Papyrus and many other suicide prevention charities, one of the critical things that people do within those charities is support the people who... who, who do do it. Yeah. And, and keep checking up on you yeah. the whole time. But there is support out there for suicide bereaved families uh, or, or anybody who's been touched by suicide. You can reach out, but you've got to, it's kind of, I wouldn't say hidden, but unless you go out and look for it, it's, look for it. Yeah. It's, not just, it's not just a pamphlet in the doctors, which it should be, yep. shouldn't it? Well, and people should just be pointed at it. Yeah. Uh, and, and different parts of the country are better at doing it. Okay. Um, there's a, a lady we came across, well, it was just before the first walk, actually, Angela Allen, uh, who's fantastic. At the time, she was living in South Cumbria, now moved back into North Lancashire. But she'd lost her daughter, and eight months later, her husband to suicide. And um, Angela and her daughter, Tash, realised that one thing that wasn't there for... for um, so, I, I, kind of when the emergency services arrived to say yeah. this has happened yeah. um, to give them something that they can help yes. rather than just give them the bad news and good luck to you yeah. and walk out yeah. um, and Angela and Tash created this thing called Bags for Strife right. and it's the idea that in the that shittiest most awful desperate first few days yeah. you need some help yeah and so they've literally got these bags, and in it there's things like lip salve, water, yeah. uh, snacks, yeah. uh, but also some leaflets that give you information about the emotions that you're likely to, to, to feel, yeah, yeah. and also contact details of uh, bereavement, suicide 
bereavement support organisations. Oh, wow. So, and, and the, what Angela and Tasha do with Bags for Strife of reaching out to, um, it's the police services they're actually going out to. So these yeah. people are equipped to go, you can leave this. Yeah. And, and the, I can't think how many uh, uh, police forces they're now dealing with, but it's quite a few. Um, I don't think Cumbria have picked it up yet. I know how Lancashire yeah. have. Yeah. Um, but it's a idea. it is. It's, it's brilliant. Something so simple. Mm. And like you say, because you yourself, you know that you just you have been an autopilot, weren't you, for so many days? <laughs> Eating, drinking was just sort of. You, 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 yeah, you, you just don't know your your worlds. Uh, it's hard to. It, well, no, it's in, not hard. It's impossible to tell you what it feels like. Yes. Because those feelings are just so intense and yes. powerful. Yeah. And. It's like you're living somebody else's life and trying to make any decision, trying to breathe, actually, is is hard. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's like a physical... Oh, physical yeah, it's painful. Like it is it's absolutely physically painful. Yeah. It really is awful. And so having something to say, everything you're feeling here is normal, and here are some ideas. Yeah. It, it is that kind of planting the seeds of hope again that you can move forward because it is when you're thrown into it when it explodes in front of you the thought of actually moving away from that place is impossible well they, they can't be any thought of when they thought of could they no it's, no so like you say it's, it's the club no one wants to be in mm. isn't it? so so with the walk you got to the end obviously you met loads of people yeah and then did it just kind of Fizzled? Did you think oh, mm. that was good? So I know you kind of were arranging to do other things, but did you expect the accolades you were going to get? No, 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 no. And the thing thing was with that that first wall. I mean, we were we had talked about what happens at the end of it. Yeah. You know, is it something that you're going to crash? Yeah. Uh, and so that was kind of in our minds. That another thing, wasn't it? Because it's that adrenaline. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, and then all of a sudden. Yeah. Oh no! What? But it it wasn't like that at all. And it was entirely because along the along the way we'd spoken to so many suicide bereaved parents and the majority of them said some very similar things like they didn't see it coming yeah. um you know, so it was it just happened in their lives shattered their lives um it was only after the the loss of their loved one that they found papyrus or other suicide prevention charities and it was then that they found that suicide is the biggest killer of under 35s. And without exception, these suicide bereaved parents were saying, why didn't anybody tell us? Yeah. Why didn't anybody tell us? Or why didn't yeah. anybody tell them? Yeah. And that kind of was overlaid with up, with me. Just before we walked, I was having a conversation with Gregor, our lad. And he said, remember all those PSHE lessons I used to do on a Wednesday morning up at Queggs? When I would come home that afternoon and say, that's another hour of my life I'm not going to get back. <laughs> Why didn't some of those address the biggest risk yeah. to our young, yeah. our lives? Yeah. Why didn't they tell us that suicide's the biggest killer and give us some clue out of? And so Greg had said that to me before we'd walked, yeah. and then all these people had said, "Why didn't anybody tell us?" And so when we crossed the finish line, I'm spoiling it for you now because it's like <laughs> I haven't got there yet. When we when we when we crossed the finish line, uh, Alison and Adam and the. BBC breakfast were there, yeah. and it was going out live on a Saturday, Saturday morning. <laughs> Bizarre, isn't it? Three blokes going for a walk, going live on breakfast. Anyway, um, the first thing Aunt Alison said to us, so what's it like to have finished? And uh, my first reaction was, well, it's not finished. The walk's done, Yeah. right? We've done that 320-odd miles, yeah. but we haven't finished because we've now learned there's this... <laughs> And we've, we've, we'd kind of developed, it felt like we'd developed a very a collective voice of all these other suicide bereaved parents yeah, yeah. who'd shared their stories with us. And so we almost felt um, we were power and empowered yes. to use those voices to ask that question, why isn't anybody talking about it? Yeah. And we didn't know what we were going to do other than we had to keep asking keep, keep, keep. that question. If suicide's the biggest risk to our young people, why don't we talk to them about it? So that was the end of the, the first walk, and it was, we didn't know what we were going to do, but we knew we had to do something. And what we ended up doing, we went and read the school curriculum, going back to Gregor's, why, why didn't anybody talk to us about it? And when we read the curriculum, it was fascinating. 
because that what's now the RSHE, so it's the Relationship Sex Health Education. Yeah. Um, and reading that, I remember reading it thinking, this is fantastic. So much of it is really good because yeah. there's a lot of stuff in there about um, emotional, um, understanding your emotions, yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of positive mental health stuff, yeah. uh, how, how act, uh, being active helps positive mental health. Yeah. So loads and loads and loads and loads of that kind of thing, which obviously when I was at school, med- <laughs> mental health, what's that? Yeah, exactly. And so when you read it, it was like, this is it's actually really good until you realise the word suicide or suicide prevention doesn't appear in it in at all. Not once, no. not once. And so that prompted us to write to the government to say, uh, why don't we talk to our young people about the biggest risk? Uh, and we got two responses. One was... Um, a letter from the Department for Education, which really pissed us off, because it just it, it was almost a generic answer. No, it kind of it was a typical politician's answer where it said, "This is what we've done, and this is how much money we've spent." And but the the, the thing that really pissed us off was it said, um, "When it comes to suicide prevention, school schools may talk to older people about this challenging subject." And so it it showed. Firstly, it wasn't compulsory. May talk to it. Yeah. To all the pupils, and that was the thing that tipped us over the edge because we met so many suicide bereaved parents of 11, 12, 13 year olds, loads. The young, the youngest Jeez. suicides we've come across, another one on this last walk we've done, eight year olds. What? Yeah. So the government saying you can only talk to people about this once they're 17 and 18. What is it the parents of those young people think yeah. that their their youngsters were never going to be given the chance to understand? That's it. So that really wound us up. Yeah, <laughs> so that was that letter. But then we also got an invitation to go and see Gillian Keegan, who was then one of the junior ministers at Health. And within her remit, she she looked after uh, self-harm and suicide. Yeah. That was in there. So we ended up in the January, February of 2022. We went and had a meeting with Gillian Keegan. And it was really interesting. Really interesting. She was... Uh, interested in what we'd found yeah. and are very open to the discussion that we were having yeah, yeah. and you know her her uh, take on it was like well listen this isn't a what you're talking about isn't just a health issue you know it's, it's across government yeah. and she she promised to take it up with her colleagues at the department for education although she did say that they're, they're really difficult to get into because everybody wants to do something in the curriculum. So the Department for Education defends the curriculum, and, yeah. you know, and, and so it's like, this is really challenging, but I will take up the conversation. But then the wheels fell off the government, because that, the following week was when that Partygate stuff wow. exploded. Yeah. So effectively the government stopped governing. Yeah. Uh, and so it was quite clear that, despite having that really positive conversation with the minister, no. Uh, and that was then prompted us. We'd been we talked about doing a second walk, but we never got our heads around what it could be. But because of the failure of government to pick it up, it was like, well, why don't we point at the government? So the the, the second walk quite quickly became walking between the Parliament buildings of the UK. So uh, and that so that then turned into a, a bit of a beast because instead of walking three hundred miles, it was just over six hundred miles yeah. with a flight from. Belfast to Edinburgh thrown in um, but we worked that up and that's what we did in the autumn of 2022 yeah. um, which turned into a again a, what a bloody experience that was and, and Not good or bad. fantastic was it good? fantastic was incredibly it? positive a bit weird because we were due to start in Belfast on a Friday yeah. early September and so we'd all uh, uh, arrived at Mike's house in Sale on the Thursday night or Thursday afternoon. Uh, we were going to get an early morning flight out to Belfast, do a short walk from the Papyrus office to um, to Stormont, yeah. then get a flight to Edinburgh where we'd begin the long walk on the mainland the following day. So we were in Manchester on the Thursday night when they announced that the Queen had died. So it was a bit of a bugger. Um, it's one of those things that you just didn't see coming. Yeah. Uh, and as it happened, 
we had both ITV and BBC in Mike's house at the same time. The both of them had come to interview us, and Mel from Granada was just leaving as Alison from the BBC arrived. When this announcement happened, it's like, whoo, what do we do? What we do? What happens now? Which we didn't, we had no idea what was going to happen. Um, obviously, the, from the media, they ended up following up and going, right, we're going to be focused somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. But they did finish their interview, so they had something in the can. And then we had to decide what we were going to do. We were going to walk or not walk. Uh, and we quickly decided we would. Uh, two reasons, really. One was, one was because on the first walk, We'd got personal letters from Prince William right. saying you're doing a great thing, you're saving lives, yeah. keep going. Wow. So we kind of thought, well, he knows what we've yeah, done yeah. and what yeah. how it's helped people. Um, and we also knew from the feedback we'd got on the first walk that by raising the profile of Papyrus and getting people to phone Hopeline UK and to get and to talk about suicide prevention, we know we'd save lives. Yeah. The feedback we got, we knew we'd save lives. Yeah. So we, then we also knew that if we didn't walk then, it'd be a, another year yeah. before we could put it all together again. And in that time, people would die yes. who, who we might be able to save. Exactly. So we decided we would walk, but we walked in the knowledge that the media couldn't cover us for, we didn't know for how long. Um, and we knew, we, but we could do it in a respectful way. So, you know, we carry these, the flags. Yeah. And we carried the flags were were furled yeah. uh, until the after the Queen's funeral when the when the flags went from half mast back up the poles, so we we didn't unfurl our flags until we were walking into Preston as it turned out. <laughs> it was that morning, um, and so we thought we would just walk by ourselves for a few days. As it happened, we hardly walked alone. People kept still kept coming out still to find out. us. We said we had the tracker turned on. Yeah. So people kept joining us, kept sharing the stories. Still really powerful stuff. Um, so by the time we got to... And that must have been great for you to know that you haven't lost that impetus. It was amazing. Still, it was you're still going strong. Uh, absolutely amazing. You know, it really was. Uh, it was reassuring to yeah. know that people were hearing this message yeah. and getting talking about suicide prevention. Yeah. And it just gives you the the incentive just to keep going. Yeah, I don't, there wasn't I mean, a... A moment on any of the walks that we've done where any of the three of us have gone no, i don't want to do this yeah, yeah. 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 oh we've been knackered enough <laughs> we've been knackered all right but, no, but, knackered, but knackered as in like yeah can, yeah yeah no there hasn't been there hasn't been a single moment yeah. for any of us um which it wouldn't have though because it must be like so beautiful when you know you, you know you've, you're basically walking the next day for 20 plus miles yeah but you've absolutely no idea who you're going to encounter yeah. and what a wonderful story you might yeah. hear and be part of. Oh, it's amazing. And it's great, isn't it? It's like, yeah. you know, just to be part of, to have touched that person's life that they felt that they had to come yeah, yeah. and speak to you guys and meet you and tell it, you their story. It's amazing. Story. Uh, no, it's amazing. It's beautiful. You know, we obviously just finished a couple of weeks ago, we finished the, the, the last walk, the third yeah. walk, where we actually walked between newly opened offices of Papyrus so it was quite a, a bit of a celebration of where yeah, Papyrus had yeah. got to, and that was. was that, did it finish it per, on purpose? At, cause it, it was no, no, that was a, that was that was bizarre. That was just a, a flu. Yeah. We we really we, the world walk the, the, the week before, before yeah. yeah. So that the, the, the that walk, the third walk, we started in Stirling, right. where there was an office that had been opened at Christmas time, and we went across to Newcastle via Edinburgh, and uh, the Newcastle office had, had opened about the same time at Christmas. And we came down to Leeds, where uh, there'd been an office there for about two years, Papyrus office. And then across to Hull, where there's going to be an office maybe this year, maybe next year. So when you say an office as well, is it a walk-in? Walk yeah, walk yeah, you could do. It's interesting, actually. The, their, their attitude to these places have changed. Uh, I shouldn't use the word office, actually. All the guys at Papyrus are calling them hubs now. <laughs> hubs, 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 hubs. Uh, and it's... it's Remember our first when I first talked to Jed Flynn, who's the chief exec of, yeah. of Papyrus. He kind of downplayed how important the offices were, but it became clear the more they opened, the more important they were. Yeah. The, they're not somewhere where people can walk in and ask for help, no. because more often than not, it's just a place that 
a person to start off with and then a group of people work out of and they go out into the community and talk to organisations, education places, schools, um, emergency services. They'll talk about suicide prevention and suicide awareness and then they'll go out and deliver. There's loads of different courses that can deliver from uh, like a 40 minute thing to a two hour thing yeah. to a two day course yeah. you know so there's all kinds of different courses and the, what would what the papyrus realized that these uh, the hubs were working to kind of galvanize communities into this awareness that you can make communities suicide safer yes yeah and so the opening of, of a hub does something really quite different I in the town yeah. it's, it's really i was just going to say that have they got sort of stats that prove that when a new hub opens Oh, I don't know. Must, must dwindle. Is that no, I, word, I, I, will, I, will, I will ask them the question. Yeah, yeah. It would be interesting to see. We, we know the awareness in terms of suicide prevention goes up massively just yeah. because of the thousands of people they end up talking to. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, the attitudes have changed towards the opening of these hubs because the, 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 it's that, that, that kind of idea that it pulls communities together yeah. and focuses the mind on, on the, this biggest killer of young people. Yeah. Uh, and as I say, biggest killer of men under the age of fifty. Yeah. If let's get, let's do something about it. it. And it's that message. It is a message of hope. Is we can do something about it, and suicides can be prevented. And so when that that third walk, we the, the places we linked up were Stirling, Newcastle, Leeds, Hull, which will be later this year, and we've actually finished the walk in Norwich, right. and they've got a we've got a place opening there. It's like within the next few weeks. Right. That's what I was thinking. Norwich and then Keswick. Yeah, well, Keswick. 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 So the Keswick, Keswick, that was. Well, Tim <laughs> Tim called me a muppet actually, <laughs> because I mean I've been involved with because of me working at George Fisher. Yeah. I was involved in the setting up of Keswick Mountain Festival in twenty yeah. twenty oh so twenty seven. Yeah. Yeah, two thousand. Yeah, twenty oh seven was the first Keswick Mountain Festival, and I've been involved with it ever since. It's gone through different changes of hands, yeah. but I've kept kind of tagging along. And um, so before we'd finalised what this walk was going to look like, I'd already committed us to being at Keswick Mountain Festival to do a talk right. and a walk. Yeah. And so what had happened was the week before we'd finished walking 530 miles in Norwich <laughs> and then obviously well, Tim stayed down the there. The and then <laughs> yeah, the following Friday we were all in Keswick <laughs> and on the Saturday we walked 19 miles around don't water and then spoke at the theater that night yeah so yeah muppy <laughs> so it, it, it wasn't it, it as it happened it turned that into a really nice way to kind of it didn't finish the walk because the walk had finished the previous week yeah. but it was kind of a real it was a pleasant way to do it because on the walk itself obviously we weren't carrying a tracker yeah. and we were still had the papyrus flags yeah. and and uh, caps and what have you and we were giving away loads of wristbands but people weren't on that walk because of to come and talk to us but people were walking the walk because they wanted to do the walk yes, yes. but they talked with talked to us as well along the way yeah. so it was, the whole thing was much more sociable and, and quite a relaxed thing yeah that so was good a good way what to finish the, what was the um what was linked up with the three four legs is that like a q a no we did a talk so literally you have to be plan a talk yep and yep. do it yep. like between the three yep and is that the same at every venue <laughs> We can, kind of do. well, we can, we can, we can, we can adapt it yeah. to, to according to our audience. Yeah. Um, it depends on what what they're actually looking for. Um, but the thing is, as you found tonight, you know, it, once we get talking, we can keep going, yes. and we're all the same. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and because because we know when we're talking to a different audience, just spreading that message of hope is so important. Yeah. We'll keep doing it yeah. and keep doing it. And you meet people after the show. Yeah. And sort of people come up and talk. Always. There's always. Always. There's always someone I can imagine that's kind of been through a similar situation. Yeah. Or people ask for advice. Yeah. And, and the thing is, there we we know we're not suicide prevention experts, but we have learned a lot yes. along the way. So we can say something appropriate. Yeah. But more more effectively, we can then po point people in the right direction, whether it be papyrus, yeah. which we we use a lot. Yeah. But in this in uh, Cumbria. I point a lot of people at Every Life Matters who are a local suicide prevention and suicide bereavement charity 
and you need to get somebody from I them do. in your I caravan of love. Show, it's all right. It <laughs> and it's Chris Wood who you're going to get hold of. <laughs> We're going to be sitting there soon, mate. <laughs> oh, oh, actually, Vicky Boggan. I'm, t- I'm, well, a, I'm, having, a, I'm having a pint with Vicky tomorrow for oh, tomorrow yeah. evening. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll tell her I've signed yeah, her up. Yeah. <laughs> but every, you know, so every life matters in Cumbria are really powerful. The, the, some of the stuff they're doing, particularly in schools, oh, is fantastic. Because that's, you see, there's so many things in schools that I, I still can't believe they don't teach. Hmm. Like first aid. Yep. Why isn't first aid? Yep. Taught? Why teach us bloody algebra? I said to my old maths teacher 40 odd years ago, I'm never going to use this. And I proved him right. <laughs> <laughs> is that just stubbornness? <laughs> If I'd have been taught first aid, I know. I, I've, been, I've used first aid, but that's only because I used to be a firefighter, so I'd have to yeah, yeah. all limb skills. But it's mental, isn't it? And what you talked about earlier. Yep. On that lesson that they have about life and you know, humanity. Yeah, yeah. Chuck's I know, I know, I know. It's not, it's not. No, <laughs> but, we'll, we'll get there. You know, we'll, on it is, the, it's kind of, it's, it's nice to listen to this because we can see that things are moving in that however slowly it might be going oh, okay. going in that right direction. well it is and on the second walk we we ran a pe- uh, petition alongside it um it was actually andy burnham mayor of manchester we'd, yeah. we'd bumped into in a couple of different places we then ended up was sitting in his office and the first thing he said to us when he, he sat down was have you got a petition uh, and he encouraged us to do that because he said when he was in the last labor government and that just said, said, if suicide's the biggest killer of our young people, why don't we have it as a compulsory subject on, on the on the on the curriculum? Yeah. And um, as the walk went on, obviously to start off with, because we were kind of undercover because of the the what, the, the mourning for the, the Queen. Yeah. Um, it dribbled in, but because we were on the road for well thirty odd days, um, the media did come back to us, and as our profile rose on that walk more signatures came in so actually the evening of the um uh, of the finish of the walk uh we ticked over a hundred thousand signatures which is what we needed to, to uh, get the government to consider it for debate in parliament um which was what we were trying to get at yep yeah. yeah. and so that actually then happened in the january of 2023 so we went down and saw this debate in um, one of the committee rooms, uh, Westminster Hall, beautiful room, yeah. and about forty MPs turned up. Wow! Um, All across, across everywhere from yeah. everywhere in the country, from every part every of the part and across yeah, and without doubt, without exception, everyone that stood up and spoke, um, they all mentioned us, and most of them mentioned our girls' names. Many shared stories about their how impact how suicide impacted their lives. Yeah. And without exception, they all said, right, we've been looking at what these fellows have been talking about, and we've gone and done our own research, and they're right. This is the biggest killer of young people. We need yeah, to... We should do. Yeah. yeah. And at the end of that, um, at that debate, uh, Nick Gibb, who was schools minister at the time, uh, responded on behalf of the government, and the critical thing he said then was, as the, the RSHE curriculum was due for a review but it wasn't wasn't due to review to be reviewed until later that year. So he said we're going to start it immediately, wow. and we'll invite these fellows to get involved. No way. Yep. That's awesome. Yeah, it was. And after after the uh, debate, there was loads of MPs came up to us to yeah. say, well, "Thank you for doing this." Yeah, yeah. And again, all of them, including Nick Gibb, said to us, "Keep going, just keep going. Yeah. That's it. That's the way we'll make it make a change. Just don't shut up." Yeah. There was a moment, one of the stats you, you mentioned in the book, and it was something like, it was something like 6,000 suicides a year, and then each suicide affects, was it 183 people? 135 is, is what they reckon. Yeah. But it's, it's so, and yeah, the impact, we know soul suicide impacted hundreds and hundreds. Yeah, yeah. And the same, same with, T, uh, with Beth and Emily. Yeah. Um, but it means that, you know, something like, just using those statistics, something like, 800,000 people yeah. are touched by suicide every, every year. year. Every so year. It wasn't, it wasn't far that much of a stretch of the imagination then that so many of, the, of those MPs yeah. were yeah. on your side because they will have been touched exactly. at some point exactly. in their life by a, by a suicide some, somewhere down the line. Exactly, they? exactly. 
And so what we're going to do about it? Yeah. And I, I know our our focus on the Department for Education and the curriculum is a real simple one because yeah. if the word suicide isn't mentioned in the curriculum, they're obviously missing the point. Yeah. So it's a very easy thing to say, if this is the biggest risk to our young people, why don't we talk, yeah. talk to them about it? What's, what's the one good reason why it isn't? Mentioned? Exactly, exactly. And so it's an easy target, but realistically our target isn't the Dep Department for Education, it's our society. Yes. We as a so society yeah. need to talk about yeah. it. And then we need, firstly, we need to be aware just how prevalent it is uh, and the impact it has. And then as adults, we kind of need to get out the way and let our young people, yeah. give them permission to talk openly yeah. Yeah. and give them the, the knowledge and skills that will help them in their lives so they can initially save themselves yeah. or help their, their friends and, and the, the people that are meeting along the way. Yeah. Which isn't, you know, it sounds so simple and easy, doesn't it? <laughs> hey, we're, we're mean, getting there. Not, it shouldn't. It, it should be that yeah. simple as other, shouldn't it? Yeah. It should really should. You know, yeah. it's not a, it's not a difficult ask. And I think like we've we've touched so many times tonight about how we are as a society. I think changing. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's always going to be certain parts of societies and cultures that will never talk about things yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. But as if we can generalize it on the whole then it's only going to be a good thing yeah isn't it? we will change we will get a really good change you're, you're right particularly the older people who are so fixed because we are you the older you get the more fixed you get in, in getting yeah. your in the ways you behave but that doesn't mean we shouldn't start to, ch to try and change our young people yeah. because if we start teaching young people now that this help seeking behavior is critical yeah as they go through their uh, school in and college yeah. and then become parents and teachers of the future their attitudes are going to be so different of course it is of course it is and we'll get people who will ask for help yeah. and will reach out and, and it's not just right. the extreme of suicide of no no not at all you know it's all aspects of life absolutely we all have ups downs yep. highs lows yeah you know it's part of the human condition isn't it yep so to just think well this is just normal i'll just talk to joe about it or i'll talk to andy about it or yep then it's it just becomes and like you just said then once those people grow and have families of their own yeah exactly it just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy yeah. of it yeah so we just try to change society that's, that's all <laughs> we're not asking for much asking for <laughs> but that's it but the, the critical thing is just to get people talking it is and, and as, as you found doing your your podcast yeah. people are coming to talk to you so it can be done, it can be done. and we've yeah. we've seen loads of, of suicide prevention lessons and workshops being delivered to young people now yeah. from ages 11 to 18 and it's it's not rocket science it's it's a challenging subject without any shadow of a doubt yeah. but it can be done it can be done safely and those young people come out of those lessons with a knowledge that helps them in their lives exactly. to protect them from the biggest killer that they're going to face in their young lives which are themselves yeah and it's it's it's, an, it's another life skill yeah of course it is it? you know and what's wrong with teaching people skills that they're going to need in their life yeah because like we said just because you're not taking it to that extreme there's, there's whatever whatever's taught in them suicide prevention talks will help in so many aspects oh, it of does. people's lives. It does, it? it does. You know, so we'll get there. It, we will. <laughs> uh, actually, just so we, to, to to kind of round up on the where we got to with the petition, you know that the curriculum review did happen. Yeah. We did get involved, and critically, as part of that review, we were asked to to introduce the Department for Education uh, ministers and civil servants. To all the experts that we've met along the way, yes. So people from um, charities like Papyrus and Every Life Matters, um, and loads of other charities, but then also loads of academics that we've met along the way, and all of them said the same thing: this is the biggest killer of our young people. We need to talk to them about it, and it can be done safely. And so uh, the review was done. A new draft curriculum was written. It's taken a month for it to come forward for public consultation, but it's there now. Right. So it came forward to consultation 10 days ago. Right. And of course, everything's now ground to a halt yeah, because, yeah. but it won't, we won't go away. No. When the new gov next government comes in, we're well, going to be there. To do with losing power, no, it right? hasn't. We you haven't. know what I mean? Whatever, whatever nope. colour or the, the blue, red, nope. Tory, whatever, it doesn't really matter. It's way it? above politics. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and we have actually sown the seeds. We've, we've spoken to all the shadow uh, ministers yeah. up to and including Keir Starmer yeah. and so they all know us and they get it yeah. they absolutely get what we're talking yeah. about 
Um, and when we uh, Kia came out and met us well, on the last walk and had a bit of a chat with us, um, and he said, right, I get it. And he actually quoted stuff back to us before we had a chance to throw it at him. It's like, oh! <laughs> you <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you got it. <laughs> and uh, And so we'll see what happens next, but we won't go away. Yeah. And, uh, so, so what is next? Oh, and you're not allowed to say. <laughs> Actually, watch this space. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. What's well, what's his space? In in a week's time, we're going on holiday to Greece. <laughs> That's what we're doing. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna have a week away and chill. chill. Absolutely chill. Yeah. Mike at the moment is knocking a house apart in Anglesey right. uh, that he needs to re- refit. Yeah. Um, so how and, are you managing to sort of? Are you all still working? No, like no. I, I, I'm, I've commi- I do um, two days a week for Sarah and Phil at Arrogans. Oh, do you? Yeah, yeah. No way. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 but I do it up at Lowther, up at the oh, bike hire. Yeah, nice, right. so I do. Although I've got to say this, obviously, the last walk kind of got in the way a bit. <laughs> but, but Sarah refuses to sack me at the moment. <laughs> uh, so I go up there a couple of days a week. Um, and uh, so it's not too onerous. Uh Mike is, is properly retired. He was fire service, fire yeah, 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 aviation firefighter at Manchester Airport. Yeah, um, but say so he's got a, this project on on his house, yeah. so he's busy. So he's Tim, busy. Tim works full time. Is Tim still working? Yeah, yeah, and a very responsible yeah. job. So I, I actually don't know how he fits what he it, does. Yeah, yeah. and it, his his family are still quite young. You know, so he's got a couple of teenagers right. on the go. Uh, yeah, no, he's I don't know how he does it. I really don't know, <laughs> but then so beyond that, we got to say once the new government's back in, we're just going to keep. We're passing. going to be on them. Yeah, we'll be on them, yeah. and uh, so I'm sure that will provoke and quite a lot of trips down to to Westminster again. Yeah. Um, How do you find the local MPs? Are they on your side? Well, yeah. Well, Neil Hudson's our MP. Yeah. Um, and he's been fantastic, fantastic. You know, his background as a vet, and, it, yeah. and vets have a very high incidents of suicide yeah. and he'd already been doing stuff as a vet yeah. on that mental health area and there's an, then as an MP he got heavily involved in rural mental health issues right. so the stuff that we were doing was directly uh, aligned to and so he really helped and has helped us right along um, Mike's MP in Sale was quite supportive yeah. um, and did some bits but no near the amount that Neil did here Tim's MP uh, is Liz Truss, and she did fuck all. <laughs> is the answer? Is I mean, with that's with a capital F as well. Uh, UCK, yeah. She was absolutely had no interest. Had no interest whatsoever. Did nothing. Now you think, at the very least, she'd have jumped on your bandwagon just yeah. to raise her own profile. Yeah. If she tried it, I think Tim would give her a good <laughs> kick in anyway. But that's a different story altogether. But you know, she was useless. But so Neil Hudson, fantastic. Because you touched on a thing there about rural. You know, because of where we live, it was. Uh, I saw um, there's a thing called Andy's Man Club. Yeah, brilliant, there. brilliant. So I follow those on Instagram and Facebook, and they, there was um, a, a young farmer, typical rosy cheeked young lad, mm-hmm. you know, out in the fields all day. And he'd gone to the pub and he just was chatting to his mates. He said, I just wanted to go to the pub and talk to my mates and tell them how I was doing. And he said, And I, I thought, how oh, fantastic that because farmers must have that. That oh, just get on with it. Kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Or oh, they'll definitely win off back in the day. Like literally, they'll have cut their own arm off. To yeah. Got to get it out of a machine, wouldn't they? That have been trapped in them. You know, they're really are a different breed again, aren't they, farmers? Yep. And it's kind of you can imagine that a young lad growing up in that environment, it would have been a for the blokey side of things anyway. Then for the farmer's side of things and everything else. Yeah. Right. But it was so refreshing to see that yep. they'd just gone to the pub. To talk about the mental health and yeah. have a good crack together and just get anything off the chest. And it's like, whoa, it's yeah. nice. Well, one of the things that, that I've been involved with, I keep getting invited to different places either to do a talk or pick up a cheque quite yeah. often in, in the memory of other people. Uh, but I've come across quite a lot of young farmers clubs who are doing some really good, good stuff. Work. Really yeah. good stuff. Because you can imagine, like, if you're... St- if you're Because uh, I, I see a lot of young lads that are farmers, obviously. Mm. They're coming through town in the tractors and you think to yourself... They've been in the, in the tractor all day long, up and down, ploughing. I know, whatever, I know, you know, I know. Just lost in the, yeah, they've got radios and things in there now. But nine times out of ten, if we're by ourselves, you're lost in your own thoughts, yep. aren't you? That is what humans do. 
So you can imagine if they're on a bit of a downer yep. and there's nobody else to talk to, you know, I'm really lucky in my job because I talk to so many people every single day. You'd, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, you can't so, escape, could you? <laughs> but it's it's good because I never get a chance to get lost in my own thoughts particularly. Yeah. I'm always occupied yeah, yeah, yeah. with other people, so it's good. But I can imagine that if I was in a job where, like a farmer, and I'm just stuck in his tractor all day long and just... And if, you know, I wake up and some days and it's just like, it's shit. But, but you know, I either I, I talk to people or I do things, and and then you realise life isn't as shit as you thought. Yeah, it, it is. Was. That's right. And you just start and you look at life yeah. differently, yeah. and everything's back to normal again. But as normal as normal as can be, in my mind. <laughs> yeah, define normal. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but I thought, yeah, fantastic. You know, those guys are now all meeting up. And it's through this sort of Andy's Man Club, which is yep. another great place. To They're fantastic. This. I think there's one just opened in Whitehaven, haven't they? Yeah, it's spreading. The Carlisle actually just opened recently. Carlisle yeah, started. and um, we'll see what happens with Penrith. It kind of depends on how many people turn up from a particular it. area. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it yeah. grows organically. Yeah, um, yeah no, I, I've been involved, accidentally got involved with um, Andy's Man Club in Whitehaven, then Maryport. Yeah. Uh, and Cockermouth, just wow, but, so they really are niche. Yeah, 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 wow. yeah. And just through, it was actually a guy I know from somewhere else. Yeah. And uh, when I was at an event, he's like, "What are you doing?" Yeah. As with an Andy's Man Club um, T-shirt on, and then got talking to him about what he was doing and what they were doing. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. And and to, uh, to like we were saying before about different charities, if if as a as a bloke, Andy's Man Club, the work they're doing across the country now yeah. is life saving, isn't it? Yeah, it's, been, it's really interesting when you talk to the guys that go as well. The hardest thing that anybody ever does at Andy's Van Club is cross the threshold the first time. Yeah. Yeah. But if, if there's anybody listening to this who's thinking about where they can get help, go and do it, do it, do it, do it. And the the feedback I've had from people who've gone to the, the Andy's Van yeah. Clubs has just been overpoweringly yeah. positive. It's, it's great, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. That's another thing. So, you know, society is... It is kind of changing, isn't it? Yeah, we're changing. It, it is. And it's, but it's slow. You'd, you'd like to change everything overnight, but it, it doesn't happen like no, that. No. But so we're, we're going to keep pushing and keep talking. And uh, we will go for another walk. Um, for next year, Mike's Mike's kind of pushing us. I was saying about he's got this house on Anglesey. Yeah. Uh, through living over there, he's met lots of people who are doing some really interesting stuff around mental health issues yeah. on islands. And we've contact, been contacted by a lot of people on islands and about that feeling of isolation, a bit yeah, like you're saying about yeah, the farmers, yeah. that islands are definitely a different place to the mainland. And so Mike wants us to do, effectively go and do a lap of Anglesey, right. uh, which I quite like the idea of that. It's about 120, 130 miles. Oh, that's so it's, uh, Well, I'll give, it, I'll give him a week. <laughs> yeah, we could do it in a week. And uh, so we might, we might see if we can work that up for next year. Yeah. Um, because it's quite a different kind of message yeah. about I- isolation, yeah. rural life, yeah. live, being brought up on an island. Yeah. So there's definitely something in that. 100%. So, but uh, I see it as well, because it's great now. You know, you're going from like, you're opening the whole kind of gamut of mental health up, aren't you, to, to everybody and every, everything, which is awesome. No, awesome. So we'll keep going. So Sophie's legacy and the girls' <laughs> legacy. We'll just, it'll never, they'll never be forgotten, will they? Well, that's the thing, you know, when, when, when we do any of, the, any of our talks, we always finish on the picture of the three girls yeah. um, because we didn't choose to come down this route. No. It was these terrible decisions that they, yeah. they made yeah. that, that kind of just threw, it throws your life into such a state of turmoil. You, you've no idea where you're going to be pointed no. when you start to put things back together. Yeah. But because of what we've then found, you know, we're talking about our girls every day. Yeah. Uh, they're in our minds every day. Uh, they're in everything that we do, and uh, using their that you know, yeah legacy is the right word. The legacy of their their lives will save other young people's yeah, lives in the has. future. Hundred percent, it has already. Yeah. Like you said that earlier. You yeah. Look back, yeah. You'll have changed lives. Oh, we have. And helped. We know we have. Know, so. so we can't stop. No. <laughs> thank you very much. And I think we'll stop at that point. I think that's a good place to finish. No, thank you. Thank you ever so much for coming on. No, thanks for inviting us along, mate. What we're going to do, we'll put all as many links as we possibly can onto the description 
on the YouTube description for this and for all the audio stuff for the Spotify's and all the rest of it. Good man. And then uh, hopefully we can help as many people as we can. Brilliant. Brilliant. I'll come. I'll come. I'll come and get a spud off you tomorrow. (laughs) (laughs) Good effort. Cheers, mate. Thanks, guys. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's episode. And uh, if you have, please put loads of comments and comment on this video. Tell us what you think about it. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more fabulous content like this that we're going to have on soon. Thanks, guys. Cheers. See ya. Ta da. As if by magic. No, great. Thanks, buddy. That was brilliant. No, you never know. Totally enjoyed that. You just never know where it goes to.